All right, so here in a moment, I'm going to come down up in front, put the microphone in front of this little stage, and give you a chance to come up and share some things that uh, you're grateful for, you're thankful for, ways that you've seen God show up in your life. But before we do that, I wanted to share a few thoughts about joy and gratitude and how they are connected. A few weeks ago, I was with some other uh, Cornerstone staff and some other pastor types, and we were uh, gathered together with a psychologist who now spends his time in the realm of neurotheology. Okay, so a lot of people have never heard of that. I think they made it up, but it is a new thing that more and more people are claiming. But the reason this new field is developing is because between 1990 and the year 2000, science discovered more about the human brain in that decade than they had learned in all the learning in all of history beforehand. They called it the, the decade of the brain. And since then, we've learned a lot about the brain. So it just keeps building and building. And what we now know is how the brain works and what things affect certain behaviors. And so some of the big things are the mallu malleability of the brain, neural pathways, there's now things called brain mapping. These are things that you might see in the news or you can look up. <clears throat> but we were together with this man named Jim Wilder who goes around teaching and he spends time teaching uh, pastors and teachers and other people who are busy working with people, helping to facilitate the process of change. And he talks to people about the science of change as it occurs in your brain. And so he was sharing that um, there's actually certain things that you can measure that help certain people grow. So one thing we know that doesn't really help people grow is shame, right? We don't really grow when we're experiencing shame. Sometimes consequences can help people grow, but it's not the best environment or emotion to help people change. What scientists can now measure is that joy is the primary emotion that is present when people really, really change. Now, I'm assuming because you are all such fantastic, healthy people that you're wanting to grow and change and heal in certain ways. And, and one reason we show up at church is because we believe that God has something to offer us that can help us move into a, a better direction. And so we care about change. But if you think about it, joy is the emotion that is needed to help people grow and change. So if you're a parent, just think about that, creating a, a, an environment of great joy to help your children develop if you're a teacher. It's really neat. Now, joy is different than what we think of as happiness. So we're consumed with happiness. We want life to go the way that we want it to. And when it doesn't, we think everything is wrong. But joy is something that is higher and is better than circumstantial happiness. I heard joy described this way years ago. I don't even remember who to give credit to, but um, I'll share it anyway. But joy is like a steel beam running up your spine, holding you up in the midst of life's storms. So it is... Um, not susceptible to circumstance. It is tougher than that, and it's something that you can actually experience joy in the midst of suffering, and you could even be unhappy and experience joy. Joy, this is what the neurologists are beginning to discover, joy is the one thing the human brain wants more than anything else. So if you think about the soul, the soul is the same way. I think that's why Jesus said things in John 17 like this, that he wishes to give us the full measure of joy and that that joy would be within us. So the question is, is how do we get joy? Joy is different than circumstantial happiness. Joy comes from our loves. The things we love, those that love us, the people that we love. So joy is meant to come from this relational part of our lives, from our attachments, from the people that are near us, the things that we care about, the people that we care about. That is where joy is meant to come from. Psalm 16, David is connecting to joy by connecting to the Lord. You, Lord, will fill me with joy in your presence. So joy comes from relationships and connection. So I'm making this, uh, this point about joy because I want you to see how important gratitude is. It can be hard for us in the midst of life and its struggles and all of the negative emotions that we experience, shame, fear, anger, to connect to joy. How many of us go through the day knowing that God cares a lot about us, that we're loved by him and other people, yet we don't move through the day joyful? One of the reasons is we're disconnected from the source of joy. But there's something that helps us connect to joy, and it's gratitude. Another thing that scientists can measure today is one of the things that keeps people connected to joy in their brain, they're observing this, is when a person is grateful. When we stop and we actually think of something that we're grateful for, a person that we're grateful for, we reappreciate something that has been given to us by someone else. And gratitude is different than appreciation. It's much higher. 
You can appreciate a sunset and not appreciate who it came from. But you can't be grateful for a gift without being grateful for the source. And so gratitude and thankfulness is really different. The doctor that we were with, he actually defined joy this way. He says, joy is knowing that you mean something to someone and that someone is glad to be with you. It's that simple. So today we're going to talk about gratitude. We're going to share stories. But I wanted to connect us to this idea that we all have something to be very, very grateful for that connects us to joy. And that is that there is a God who thinks something of you and is really glad to be with you. This tradition of being grateful goes way back in the journey of faith. What science now knows about the body and how important gratitude is, like you live longer, you're better equipped to deal with depression, you sleep better, there's other little things, just you handle relationships better, you're more resilient to life storms, you're more humble, you have more self-respect. Those are things that come with gratitude. What science now knows, Moses knew a long time ago. And that is why he told the Israelites, in the midst of their struggle, but also when life was really, really good, he said over and over again, do not forget what God has done for you. Do not forget what life was like before him. Do not forget that there is a God who thinks something of you and cares about you. So we see that exhortation over and over again in Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. But then we see this idea of giving thanks being played out in the life of the Bible. So if you look at Psalm chapter 95, David says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Isn't it nice to know that we have a foundation that will not crumble? I think of it this way when I think of the rock. We have someone to hold on to when life is dark. When everything else is shaking and falling apart, we have someone to hold on to. In Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Let them go on and on of how they have been saved, they have been redeemed, they have been rescued. Maybe today you can be thankful for the fact that God showed some of his hesed, his ever-expanding love to you this year. That he surprised you. Maybe your faith was getting older, it was dead, but somehow God surprised you all over again because his love breaks bounds. It bridges every gap. Maybe there was a part of your life that was in pieces and slowly, one at a time, it's been put back together and you look back and you see the providence of God in your life. Those are things to be grateful for. Paul continues this Jewish theology about gratitude into the New Testament. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Messiah Jesus, Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 4, the end of this letter to some people he really cares about. He says, devote yourself to prayer, be thank watchful and thankful. Modern Christians are pretty good at being watchful and thinking about prayer, but we're not so good about being thankful. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it ends with this, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And it's referring to the gospel. God doing for us for what we could not do for ourselves, Jesus on the cross and in the grave, taking our life and giving back the very best to us. He took our very worst and he gave us his very best. And if that moment and that gift that God gives us doesn't scream that there is someone who thinks something of you, and there is someone who is pleased to be involved in your life, I don't know what else would. The gospel is the greatest expression of God's love, of joy, and so we have a lot to be thankful for. But we don't want to just talk about that today. We want to give you a chance to share about specifics. Maybe someone showing up in your life, God's provision, a new job, a new friend. These are all gifts that the Lord gives, but they're meant to be shared. The Hebrew word for thanks is the word yada which actually means to send, or yada was used to describe throwing something or sending an arrow. What it means is that our thanks are meant to be things that we send out to other people and to the Lord. They're meant to be spoken, and so we're going to do that, and we're going to follow along in this deep tradition of giving thanks. Now, let me connect it to our history as Americans. So we all know the story 400 years ago, a group of Protestant Christians called the Puritans celebrating life, the fact that they had survived, set apart a day called Thanksgiving. They stopped, and they were grateful to God. They worshiped, they praised God, they thanked him for what he had done, and they celebrated that together. 
Since then, there have been many days designated as days to give thanks in our country. Often during the Revolutionary War, George Washington would appoint certain days or set apart certain days as days to give thanks for miraculous victories. But it wasn't until about 150 years ago that a very persistent lady who was uh, an incredible author and editor of a, a famous magazine on the East Coast who had been petitioning the president and elected officials for some 30 years that we needed an annual day to give thanks, a tradition to give thanks. Sarah Haley often said that we need a moment to return to gratitude, that the country, the young country, needed a chance to return to giving thanks. Why? Because they're like we are. We drift, and we're very aware of the things we don't have. We dwell on our problems, and we miss the gifts that are right in front of us. So she gives us a tradition. On October 3rd, 1863, President Lincoln actually finally made Thanksgiving Day an annual holiday in our country. And I want to read part of the declaration that he sent out to the entire country that day because it has a I think it has a lot to do with where we are as a country and a people today. Okay? So just forgive me as I read along. A little dyslexic, but I'll do my best here. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessing of fruitful fields, and healthful skies, to these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have also been added which are so extraordinary in nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. He goes on to say, No human counsel hath devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of a most high God, who while dealing with us in anger, the reason he says this in the midst of the civil war and a lot of suffering, dealing with us in anger for our sins hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly and reverently and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe that this last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend that while offering up these ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national Persevere or our national mistakes and disobedience, commend to his tender care all of those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, and sufferers in this lamentable civil strife in which we are all unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of this nation and to restore it as soon as it may be consistent with his divine purpose and to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. Do you think we could use a lot of gratitude or a little bit? Gratitude connects us to joy. And joy reminds us of who's dear to us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get to share what we're grateful for. And so this is uh, what we would like. So you can just come on up. Those of you in the balcony, you got a ways to go. You can still come on up. And you can just come up and line up uh, up on the stage if we have a number of people that are already up here. I would ask that you only take a couple minutes, so think through some of the things that you want to share and just take a couple minutes so we have time for a number of people to share. And what we want to hear is how God has cared for you in this last year, how he has shown up in your life. And it can be very specific. It can be about someone. It can be about a job. It can be about provision. It can be about a dream that God has uh, brought into your life. So it can be that specific. But we would ask you just take a couple minutes and you come up and share. And this is one reason we do it. We don't just think that we're a public meeting. We think of ourselves as a congregation, a community, a family. And families are meant to share stories together. They're meant to share in suffering. They're meant to share in victories. They're meant to draw strength from one another. So this is one of the, our traditions here at Cornerstone. We do this this Sunday every year, and we're glad to do it. And so let's pray. Let's get our hearts in the right place, and then you can come on up. So, Father, we ask just for your Holy Spirit, to, to nudge us now, to give us a gentle whisper. 
pray for everyone in this room that we might be reminded of certain moments of joy, that we would be grateful for them right now. Maybe a time this year where we felt loved by a friend or loved by a stranger. Help us remember. Father, help us remember a time maybe this year where you became very present to us, that we all struggle with doubt and wondering how close God is. But maybe there was a moment that we felt your presence, which was very, very close. Help us remember. Maybe it's something simple, but something that we all need. Provision, a safe place to live, enough food, a new job. Help us remember, Lord. And God, as we share our gratitude, I pray that we all might be connected more and more to joy to the fact that there is a God who thinks something of us, who loves us, and who's happy to be with us. And so, Lord, we just ask for you to work during this time, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.